Thank you all viewers for joining us. I'm Karagawa Bordrins. It's the 19th of March 2018. And we're disrupting normal programming to bring you a critical discussion on some aspect that is really, really uh, huge for us to put attention to. And that is the Girl Child Education Progress in Uganda. And before we engage into a detailed studio discussion, let me have this preface play and then we'll come back. Uganda overall has a strong legal framework protecting the right to education as a fundamental human right enshrined in the 1995 constitution. Uganda has signed and ratified the following important regional and international conventions protecting the right to education including the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 26, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 28, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Article 10, and the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, Article 11. These provide a comprehensive set of good education policies that aim at ensuring education for all and that efforts are being made to reach the most vulnerable people. Nevertheless, according to the 2015 Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Supported Report, Uganda has made mixed progress towards gender equality in education. In primary education, gender parity is at 91% of the school age population being enrolled. However, female literacy rates lag behind at 49% compared to 69% of males and gender gaps widen at secondary and tertiary school. There are many factors that have been cited to contribute to women and girls' education in Uganda and to girls dropping out of school. Data from the Ministry of Education and Sports shows that school dropout in the country is higher at the primary level than at secondary level because of lack of interest, pregnancy, early marriages, hidden costs at school, and family responsibilities. Research has found that adolescent pregnancy and early marriage remain two of the main barriers to girls' education. According to UNICEF 2015, approximately 35% of girls drop out of school because of early marriage and 23% do so because of early pregnancy. In Uganda, the teenage pregnancy rate is 24% with regional variations, which increases to 34% in the poorest households. Many cultural settings in Uganda stigmatize premarital pregnancy among girls, both in school and in communities, because it is seen as a taboo. The Constitution emphasizes that all Ugandans must enjoy rights and opportunities and access to education without any form of discrimination. It also emphasizes the need for affirmative action in favor of groups marginalized on the basis of gender, among other social categories, for the purpose of redressing imbalances which exist against them. On top of the diverse stakeholder efforts undertaken by government and several other civil society organizations in palliating this anomaly of the Uganda child facing difficulties in accessing and enjoying education, a particular community organization in Uganda called Child Risk Action Network, CRANE, is helping to pragmatically provide some solutions. NTV, in partnership with Child Risk Action Network, bring to you this discussion on how we can enhance the environment for the Ugandan girl child to successfully get education. Follow and engage with us on this discussion on our Facebook and Twitter platforms. You are welcome. We apologize about that delay. I'm Karagawa Bodwins, and you've gotten the introduction, that preface about this whole matter of concern, child, girl child education. And on Facebook, for purposes of ensuring that uh, we are coordinating this discussion with you, you can go online and we posted their question, what improvements do we need to make to realize better education support for girls in Uganda? I'll be citing out your comments and contributions in the course of the discussion. So let's get ready and started 
in the uh, main studio discussion, and here I have a, a very vibrant panel of uh, education specialists and uh, concerned with girl education. At the extreme left, I have Angela Nakafeo, who is a gender specialist, Minister of Education, Gender Unit. Angela, you're welcome. Thank you. Indeed. And uh, in the middle, I have Paul Kabunga, who is the Viva Africa consultant. Paul, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Yes. It's good to be here. Ah, you're welcome. And uh, right at my immediate left, we have Faith Kembavazi, the Crane Executive Director. And uh, Faith, let me just start straight with you, so you help us just to give a brief about what Crane is, because uh, we believe you're doing a significant job and you're partnering with us in having this communication. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, my name is Faith Kembavazi, and uh, I work with Crane, which is Children at Risk. We need to make that correction because it's been advertised as Child Risk. It is Children at Risk Action Network. Our offices are in Anurembe, and we focus on keeping children safe, children in families, but for today, children in education, and that's girls in particular. And that's our work. We've been, um, we've been in existence since 2012, mm -hmm. since 20, 2002, and uh, we have worked with different network members. Because we are a network, and we work with different organizations that work with children at risk, that is uh, schools, uh, children in, in, uh, in homes, the, mm -hmm. the homes that they talk about, that's children off the street or abandoned, and then children in churches and in schools. So mm -hmm. we work in those different areas. Yeah, you, you children children uh, children are vision uh, that the children should be safe, well, and fulfilling their God-given potential, mm -hmm. which is on the, the... Okay, so you, you feel you're fulfilling that vision? We are making progress. All right. Okay, so let me go to Angela. The, the policy realm individuals. So according to the 2015, 2019 National Strategy for Girls Education, I hope you are aware of that, it was observed that there had been an increase in the number of girls accessing education at the level of entry, particularly for primary schooling, uh, which was at parity at 50 to 50 mark. Yeah. But the access to UPE education increased yeah, significantly between 1997 to 2008. That's just a, an old report, mm -hmm. uh, but even currently it's still the, the trend. So they, th there is a broad national strategy that guides national programming for girls' education. It is a tool that uh, uh, different stakeholders in promoting girls' education should use to carve out uh, activities related to their areas of mandate on girls' education. So wh why is there a special focus on girl education rather than a holistic kind of gender focus uh, in terms of general education mm -hmm. and we exclusively come in to deal with a girl. That the entire policy structure is actually geared to do an exclusive uh, uh, attention to that. Isn't this a sexist agenda and approach <laughs> to education? So what's wrong with the girl child? Uh, thank you very much dear moderator. Well when uh, you look at enrollment mm -hmm. in terms of uh, boys and girls We've made quite a lot of significant achievement. Primary one, primary two, primary three. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking at the enrollment in primary five, six, and seven, you literally see a gap emerging. When it comes to secondary, still the numbers of girls in schools is still low. And of course, sir, when you look at other factors that we measure, in terms of quality of education, mm -hmm. where we are looking at uh, retention, we are looking at completion. Completion is the percentage of learners that register for national examinations and those actually that sit for those examinations. For instance, if you look at uh, pr primary living examinations, completion rate is standing at 67%. Uh, mm -hmm. And that of girls is slightly lower. When you reach to a level, the number of girls is still small. University, we are doing relatively well, because currently we stand at 44%. Because of affirmative of the action, entry point. Indeed, point basically <laughs> mainly because of affirmative action, which we celebrate, because it really helped us to reduce the gender gap between boys and girls in higher institutions of learning. So when you look at all those indicators of quality of education in Uganda, you really see that the gap between boys and girls is wide. And of course, at the end of the day, disadvantaging the girls. It's basically because of that background that we chose to focus on girls' education, not that we want to disadvantage boys or men. It's because we want to bring up a balance. 
Mm. Our constitution is saying equality, gender equality to everybody regardless of sex, regardless of location, regardless of age. So we are saying that uh, for us to be able to address the gap mm -hmm. that is at all levels of education, put aside enrollment in lower primary classes, we still have lots of gaps. Mm -hmm. So that is why we are focusing on promoting girls' mm -hmm. education to help us be able to narrow the mm -hmm. gap between boys and girls as well as the gap between men and women. Mm -hmm. In addition to enrollment, when you look at, uh, say, the learning environment, we still have issues. Literally, when you look at uh, retention, that is, we are looking at those, the number of boys and girls that start in primary one, mm -hmm. and those that finally make it in primary seven, you can see that uh, the number of girls is lower. Currently, we are standing at uh, 34 percent, mm -hmm. and of course, that sends signals that there is an issue. We tend to lose a more number of girls yeah, along, along the way. So very few are able to make it up to P7. And the same picture is re reflected at all level. Similar picture is also reflected at A level. Mm -hmm. So the focus on girls' education is not that we are want to disadvantage the men or boys. Mm -hmm. It's out of justice, natural justice, mm -hmm. that really we need to do a lot more in terms of promoting women and girls in education. Yeah, so I'll come back to that because it's, it's a controversial kind of uh, <laughs> build-up and uh, it's said, sending some kind of cultural shift uh, uh, signal uh, that somehow is actually ostracizing boys to a, some extent. We'll come back to that. Let me first get Paul into this and I, I, I still need perhaps all your contribution. So, uh, let's get... Uh, Paul, first get me understand uh, what Viva Africa is, and then we get maybe facts about the progress already done mm -hmm. uh, in this line. Because uh, according to the 2015 Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Supported Report, a report which was done by the ministry but uh, supported by OECD, um, it, sh it showed that in primary education, just as we've been saying, the gender parity was at 91%. Parity, that means the balance uh, in terms of uh, the entry. And However, Female literacy rates lagged behind at 49% compared to 69% uh, of males and gender gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the conclusion is that they are excluded or girls are excluded, which to some extent some people can dispute or <laughs> maybe have a different opinion. <laughs> so Paul, uh, in that regard, just first help us understand what Viva Africa is, in, I think, conjunction with uh, CREN, and then your own findings about the progress done. Are we really still that bad? And if we're that bad, do you think the conclusions we're making as to be the, 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 the substratum problems, they're actually the real problems, or is it something else? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Viva uh, Africa is part of um, a, a wider network of, uh, of Viva, which started uh, way back uh, in, 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 in Brazil, and in, uh, it's now based in Oxford, and our branch is there in Africa here. And uh, our, our role is to develop collect, collect, co collaborative uh, partnerships between agencies that are working with children. Mm -hmm. So once upon a time, we, uh, we came to Uganda and uh, found out who is working with children in Uganda and put them around the, a table and encouraged them to work together. And that gave birth to CRIN, mm -hmm. um, uh, which, is not, which works with uh, you know, very many uh, organizations, about 140 organizations. Yeah. So our role is to get people to uh, inspire them to work together and support them to, to work together as they respond to the needs of children mm -hmm. at risk um, all over the world. And so we work in, a, in, a, in some cities. We, we, we focus on a, a city-wide approach to looking at the needs of children mm -hmm. in, a, in a given area. So that's what we are about. Mm -hmm. And so my, my role is to, <coughs> to support the team as they do what they do. And it might be technical support, uh, doing a lot of um, learning to say, how can we mine out of uh, the programs that we're doing uh, with children? And but also to ensure that we, we deliver good quality programs. And so that's uh, uh, my role with, uh, with, with CREN. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the question you're asking about uh, uh, children and the issue of parity, um, there's been significant progress made by the Ministry of Education. Uh, they've done a lot of work in ensuring that uh, we reduce the gap between uh, boys and girls going to school. 
Uh, a study has been done by the ministry to compare figures between 2008 and 2014 and say what is the, what is the gender parity. So in 2008, for example, 54% of the boys and 46% of the girls would be in school. That was the gender parity. And then when you come to 2014, the figures have changed to mm -hmm. 53 to 47%. So mm -hmm. the gap is reducing. Actually, the, the, mm -hmm. the ones I have is 49% to 69%. Uh, yeah, pro probably. Uh, say the, the, the Ghana report that we have from okay. the strategy documents. All right. It says uh, the figures have reduced from... And that's where now the problem is, because the statistical output mm -hmm. uh, that is generated from all the surveys and mm -hmm. the investigations usually give some kind of uh, either uh, differentiated or kind of uh, non harmonized yeah. data which because yeah. I have this is a I have the report right there I just extracted this information okay, okay. Mm -hmm. you can um, so the ones you're talking about are from then that the, the Minister of Education yes. the gender policy mm -hmm. document which was uh, published in 2017 mm -hmm. so that's what it gives us the gender uh, you know, parity figures so the the, the 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 gap is reducing and we can say that this progress that has been uh, made primary school education for example completion rates they have improved in 2008 we are at around 47 percent we have now reached 72 percent but the bigger question is how many of those girls are able to complete uh, uh, school again the figures have improved from 65 percent in 2002 to around 86.2 percent of the girls are able to complete um, uh, their, their education in, in, in uganda so again we see the girls the parity decreasing the figures are becoming better uh, by the years and by the day given the efforts that the ministry and the government of Uganda have put into this whole game. What about the enrollment and dropout? Uh, our sister, has, Angela, has shared with you the, the fact that even the dropout rates are improving over the years from 46% at one time for the girls to, uh, I mean, yeah, 46% of the girls were able to complete school. It's now getting to 53%. In Tasha institutions, it's also improved from 38% to around 44% of the girls getting into tertiary institutions over the last uh, between 2002 and 2000, 2008 and 2014. So we can say that we have started making progress in reducing the gap uh, between boys and girls in terms of access to education. Mm -hmm. Even in terms <coughs> of uh, dropout rates, how many of them are able to complete uh, UCE exams? Okay. Uh, uh, we, have, we still have a challenge. We still have a challenge. Forward, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because um, for the for the girls, up to 66 percent dropout, and for the boys, it's up to 55 percent dropout. Are not able to complete. You're school. talking about the people who have gotten in secondary school, yeah. and 66 of them, 66 yeah, percent of them are not able to complete. Wow. Even mm. for boys, it's 55 percent. Yes. not good. Absolutely. But um, the thing, the, the fact is that um, there's an improvement, but the dropout rates are still unacceptable, and you still have more girls mm. dropping out of school compared to the boys. Mm. So many more girls are not able to complete. Okay. And so that's an issue of concern. And uh, I'm not surprised that government's efforts are focusing on how can we ensure that we bring the girls up to that mm -hmm. level where we have uh, you know, gender parity. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, well propounded. Uh, Faith, I, I don't know what you can add on this. You're a realist. You're on the ground. Is, is this... Is this a, a good situation? Is it an improved situation? Or we are actually stagnant? Because some of, some of us, based on what we have progressively been studying, I, I, I do a, some kind of reading, mm -hmm. but it's the same kind of narrative, lamentation, and you can see it on the ground, that actually people don't go into school sustainably. Yes, and there are different reasons for that, because uh, we know that the government <coughs> is doing their part, but we have different players in working with girls to be able to go to school and finish school. We have the parents that need to do their part. Of course, they're paying school fees, but a lot of the issues that bring children out of school, especially the girls, is pregnancy in school. And uh, there is no, um, at the moment, we know that we are reporting those cases, but the cases are not getting justice. If a teacher impregnates a girl in school, they don't actually deregister the teacher they just move the teacher to another, another school. school. And so that means the cycle continues to happen. So Minister of Education needs to bring into play that if any ch uh, teacher is caught molesting a child, defiling a child, then they should be deregistered as teachers and shouldn't be allowed anywhere near mm -hmm. children in school. But also there's uh, the early marriages, which everybody knows about, mm -hmm. and it's happening <coughs> in the rural areas. 
and the, the statistics are high that after P7, the girls get married off because they're about 12 years and they started their menstruation period so they can give birth. And so the parents do not put as much importance in a girl's education as in a boy's education. And therefore that brings down, of course, the literacy and uh, the numeracy rates for girls being able to read and write and work out their own uh, job issues as, as girls. And so we need to be able to put policies in place that actually deal with the culprits or who marry the girls off. One, the parents themselves have got to be um, made sure that they, they understand they shouldn't marry their girls off girls are not property to just be married off, but also the people marrying them. Why would you marry a girl? I'm sure there are many other older girls that can be married who are above 18 <laughs> instead of going for the very young ones. So those are some of the main issues where the girls are dropping out. Of course, there is issues like san sanitary pads, issues that has caught fire and everybody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. But I know that that's not the main issue, that there are other issues we need to think about and, uh, and deal with, mm -hmm. with the girls, as the government does their part, but we also, as parents and as child actors, do our part to push this forward. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, you talked about the disparity of uh, looking at boy girls more than boys. We have been fighting the fight of bringing up the girls. Mm -hmm. We have reached the level of where, yes, girls are talked about more, and therefore the boys shouldn't be ignored at this stage. So we need to bring that in but the girls still need our effort mm -hmm. to come up and be encouraged <coughs> to, to get back into school and finish school. Mm -hmm. and yeah, be able we, to we're, we're going to deal with the issue of affirmative action and uh, the principle that, or, or the message that it connotatedly uh, pushes to society. So l let me go for a break, and uh, Angela, when we come back, I need you to help us go on the policy aspect. There are some policies which are in place. If you still have a persistent problem of this kind, are the policies really working? Are the implementers working? or we have a shell of uh, <laughs> policy facets that mm -hmm. are really not serving any purpose. And uh, our viewers, thanks for keeping with us. Uh, we're going to go for a short break, and then we we'll come back and continue this discussion. Thank you for staying with us, um, Karagawa Bolin. So let's have a, just a, a, an overview of what is being done by this agency, by this organization called Children at Risk uh, a Action Network, just uh, in a minute. In Uganda, increasing urbanization has led to a breakdown in the traditional ways of caring for orphans and children who have run away from home. This has caused responsibility for these children to be transferred to childcare institutions. In the last five years, Viva's partner network, Crane, has successfully reintegrated more than 1,700 children from childcare institutions into families, providing families with counseling, economic empowerment, and basic needs. We also train and equip churches to help the concept of foster care to take root. The place for children to grow is not in an institution. And therefore we encourage institution directors and social workers to trace the children back to their families because it has been discovered that over 70% of these children in institution care have family on the ground. And if they don't have family, we can find foster parents who can take them on and eventually adopt them. Our desire as trained is to make sure that a child is taken back to grow in a home where they are loved, they are given individual care, and they know their route to where they belong. So, the role of CREEN in child uh, reintegration, we mean we do capacity building, we do the coordination, we do awareness creation, just because we need support. You get support from different stakeholders, 
and if you, we build capacity in a way we train them on how well they can manage the integration process. We partner with quite a number of uh, stakeholders in the community. We work with the police, the Child and Family Protection Unit. We work with probation, that is the uh, probation and social welfare officers. We work with local councils at the community levels and also local leaders, but as well with child care institutions. Crane works to see children in safe spaces through two ways. Prevention. This is to strengthen families to avoid separation. For children to stay safe in a family, sometimes that family needs extra support. Crane works with people in the local churches to support the high-risk families with spiritual nurture, economic empowerment, educational support, and parenting skills. The second way is treatment or reintegration. This is to see that children are reintegrated back into their families. The process of reintegration is a four-stage process that starts with rescue, where children are taken from the streets into rehabilitation homes or dropping centers. Rehabilitation. This is an essential stage where children are accepted, given psychological help, basic education and prepared to live in a family setting. And thank you indeed for being with us. Uh, we are with an organization called Child at Risk uh, Action Network and they're the ones doing all that kind of work besides taking care of the girl child and ensuring that they stay in school. And uh, on Facebook I already have uh, some respondents. Uh, James Mwebazi says that our wonderful citizen for every effort you want to put in place Please use the word our children. I'm not opposite with girls initiative. Okay, the, the, the grammar is a bit uh, uh, jumbled up, but girl, But I think the point is, you're saying, boys are fathers of the future, so I'll be, greatly, uh, be grateful to hear a word for our children, but not uh, making a disbalance against the boys. And then Wamboka, uh, Wycliffe says that the government should focus more on non- government organizations dealing with girl education and guide them accordingly. Your contribution, please continue. I'll, con I'll also continue citing them as they come in. So, yeah, Faith, uh, good job. It, it looks a tremendous effort that you're doing. Just Thank a wrap-up on what has been cited in the week. The clip you've seen is uh, our focus on children and families. But the children in education, we focus mainly on those, the girls that have dropped out of school. As I said before, due to pregnancy and uh, early marriages and lack of uh, school fees and so what we do is we have created 20 learning centers where we help the girls catch up that is the ages of 9 to 18 where we help the girls catch up and we encourage almost 50 percent of them to join main school so that they can continue with their education and the others who feel that they cannot really have uh, any more learning to do in main school they go for vocational skills so that they can start earning and looking after their babies mm. when uh, the need arises. And so we encourage that number. We started in 2013 with some uh, fund f funds from UK Aid, and we have managed to reach over 4,400 girls who dropped out of school, and we've brought them back into a catch-up center to learn and get back into main school. And so in 2016, we know that children transition from one uh, section to another. 2016 we had 60 girls who were sitting P7 mm. and uh, 24 sitting S4 and 1 sitting S6. 2017 we had 113 sitting uh, P7, uh, 56 sitting S4 and 8 sitting S6. So the numbers are encouraging. This year we have 168 sitting primary school, 91 S4. Entire by, by you people. Nine. Actually we did not sponsor them. Mm. What we have done is we've worked with parents on the ground to make sure they have the ability to pay school fees for their children because we do need as Uganda to teach parents that their, 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 their children are their responsibility, not the responsibility of the government or the donors that we have. And so we have that section of our work working with parents mm. in parenting skills, in child protection, but also in making sure that they have the ability to pay school fees for their children. Mm. It is a struggle, but they are managing, and we applaud them. Yeah. And so 
that's what we do. Our, our, pro our approach is that they can learn in class, they can learn other skills like confidence and self-esteem to be able to say no to our guy if they keep pressing them for sex so that they don't have to drop out of school again. And so we encourage them to learn those sorts of life skills, but also to learn numeracy and literacy in class but also the partners we're working with, we're encouraging them to uh, use best practice, like schools. We're saying, let's use best practice in the way we deal with children mm -hmm. and the parents. Let's involve the parents in the education of their children. Let's have the parents every day catch up with their girl and say, where have you been? What have you learned? What can you tell me today that has been interesting in your life? Mm -hmm. So that the girl feels like the parent is interested in them and they have an accountability to give to their parents because they have a responsibility to, to go to school and learn as well. And mm -hmm. so if all players are able to act in that aspect where we are all working together, government, mm -hmm. child advocate, parent, and child themselves, able to come together and fulfill one objective mm -hmm. will be very good. Oh. And that's what we're mm -hmm. doing at the moment, trying to bring all those actors together. Mm -hmm. Tremendous work, tremendous work indeed. Thanks. And, and Angela, so in response, the general superintendent so of uh, schooling system, Minister of Ed Education. So there's so many reports. There's another report I'm citing, the Uganda Gender in Education Policy, which was designed in, in line with the 10-year education sector strategic plan 2007-2017, uh, which has actually lapsed. Uh, it provides a, pro from a framework for the implementation and monitoring of a gender-sensitive and responsive education system in Uganda. So um, we, we need, th there's many policies. Okay. Yeah, there are actually many policies. Let me not try to rescind my <laughs> words. Okay. Which, do you, are all these policies working? Or you should be candid and say there are some policies which are not working? Is it the policy implementers? Or we are actually developing the wrong policies? Thank you very much. Of course, uh, <coughs> we have a number of policies based on the number of issues that the sector is struggling with. In terms of girls' education, and gender equality within the education sector. We have the gender in education policy, which you're citing. And of course, uh, it was designed in 2009. Implementation has been going on up to date. The review indicated that, yes, we've made some progress. But of course, there are gaps that we need to address as a sector. When you look at other policies like uh, the universal primary education, Yes, we've, made, we've registered some progress in terms of enrollment. At least we are able to say that 50% girls are in school and then 50% boys are in school. Total number of girls mm. and boys mm. in, in school has improved. We are also seeing significant improvement in other indicators, in completion and retention. But of course we've not achieved it all. There are still gaps. When you look at the universal secondary education, yes, we've achieved in terms of enrollment. And of course, the issue was to increase access to education regardless of sex and wherever you are. But of course, uh, when you look at other indicators, like uh, as my friend was citing, in terms of literacy, we've improved, but there are issues. In terms of uh, numeracy, we've improved as a sector. And of course, there are gaps. Of course, uh, as a sector, we are looking at registering a 100% increase across the areas. But of course, that comes with a lot of commitment from the sector, from government itself, from the sector itself, from the parents. We have the teachers in school, but of course, uh, for learning and teaching to take place, mm -hmm. a lot of more support is required from the parent. But similarly, Commitment is also required from the learner herself to come to class, concentrate, listen to what your teacher is telling you, and be able to learn. So we need to work closely together. Different tenants in terms of delivery of education need to work together. We have the policies. Some are working very well. And of course, uh, the indicators indicate so that we've improved. That does not mean that we stop here. A lot more needs to be done in terms of ensuring that our policies are working. When I look at, uh, of course, Faith and my colleague has been emphasizing the aspect of dropout. 
when you look at uh, available research indicates that a dropout has is mainly due to a number of factors economic factors yes government is paying school fees but there are there are much more costs that are required for the parents or the guardians to keep the children in school learning of course they need books they need meals they they need to participate they need to love education and equally even the parents need to be supportive so in addition to the investments that government is making in terms of increasing access parents also have to make their contribution mm, just just in a minute do, do you think are you getting the right the appropriate amount of resources and do you think you have the right people in your ministry to actually make sure that all these policies are implemented because it's a lamentation all over that you have very well written intentions but they don't do you think you have the right people well i don't think i'm lamenting i think what i want to emphasize is we've yes. made some progress so do you have the right people at the ministry? and of course uh, having the resources required yes. When we talk about resources, we refer to human resources, uh, and financial, finance, and infrastructure, infrastructure yes. and so on and so forth. There's a deliberate effort that has been made to mm. recruit teachers. Okay. There's a deliberate <coughs> effort that has been made by government to construct classrooms and have schools mm -hmm. and have children accessing a decent learning environment. But of course, what goes on in the classroom also determines the outcome, what goes on in the homes also contributes to the outcome and of course what goes on in the communities. If I give you an example, mm. when you look at the dropout, it's been an issue for the sector, but uh, available research indicates that 42% 40, of those that are dropping out are basically because of lack of these small, small scholastic materials mm -hmm. that are required. Okay. So For that girls, yes, 25% yeah. due to teenage pregnancy and child marriage, mm -hmm. which Faith emphasized. And of course, when you look at it, some of the factors can be in the school, but much more factors are also outside the school. Okay. So what it requires is all of us, we need to work together, be able to respond to the factors that seem to stand in our way in terms of delivering education for our boys and girls. Okay. And of course the commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, perhaps the question was too hard and you're not the appropriate person to answer that. Uh, so, uh, Paul, but well put, uh, good response indeed in technical <laughs> terms. So there is an ag um, the policy of affirmative action in Uganda, which is constitutionally embedded. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, uh, it, it's defined as an action or policy favoring those who tend to suffer from discrimination, especially in relation to economic welfare, like likely unemployment or education. Just an attempt to make sure that uh, there's progress towards substantive rather than merely formal window dressing or e equality of opportunity. We, we've reached a point, and there's a frustration. You, you have this promulgation of this uh, affirmative policy, affirmative action policy, but still, the same narrative continues that the girl child is still uh, either, you know, not well taken care of. Other people are seeing that actually girls have, girls have come up. When you go to most corporate offices, girl ladies are in those corporate offices, which is becoming kind of politics literally is littered and flooded with ladies, which is good. <laughs> so I'm asking myself, should it have we reached a point to drop? Just discard this policy and we just get back on level ground, no affirmative kind of uh, exclusive favoritism to ladies and have a, play, a, a, a level playing field for both girls and boys? Um, <laughs> drop it, uh, maybe not. I think mm -hmm. we, we live with an ancient grudge and battle between the genders, all the way from our cultures, where in many ways mm -hmm. our female uh, gender is uh, not as favored as we are. We seem to be the norm as, as, as male and everything else revolves around us. And probably we still need this affirmative action. I still think we need it. However, one of my colleagues was saying, maybe we need to review how it is done. I mean, there's evidence of progress being made. We have many leaders now who are women, and mm -hmm. they're doing amazing things in this city. <coughs> you said we are finding them in uh, you know, the corporate sector in the country, and uh, they're very effective. We are finding them in leadership in politics, and uh, we, we have no regrets as a country having women doing these, these roles. So what do we need to do more or better? Possibly, I think one of the things is to, is to review 
how we implement affirmative action. At the moment in terms of education, it's at the uh, university level, entry into the university or tertiary institutions. Maybe we need to rethink at primary school level, what do we need to do? Okay, at all levels, what do we need to do? Can we get higher numbers of children or girls getting to the higher levels of education so that by the time you implement affirmative action, the numbers are critical. So we need to develop a critical mass of the girls at a, a lower level than up there because we've lost it already. If, if, if the, the, the dropout rate is up to 66% at all level, at HSC it's even much higher. So by the time you implement affirmative action, you just have a very small uh, size of, or numbers of girls at that level. And therefore, maybe we need to review how it is implemented. Uh, that's one thing I, th I think about. Mm. The other is, could it be targeted? There are some people who are, because of where they live or geogra geographically where they are placed, then they're, in, they're doing very badly. Karamoja, very few girls come out from that place and they have lots of brains from that part of the world. In the rural areas of Uganda, in the villages, there are many girls who do not have the advantage that the girls in the cities have. Could we do affirmative action at that level? Because some people, because of where they geographically live, they are not in favor of, of the good things. Courses at university. How many girls do the sciences? They seem to be fewer and fewer. Could we revise how we, we define affirmative action at that level so that you have many more girls you know, doing the science subjects as opposed to just the boys only because they don't square certain grades? Because at that point, we seemingly are all almost at the level. Yeah, uh, but but you don't want to uh, dilute academics with uh, too much excessive favoritism that there is no meritocratic kind of access to that level. And yet you're trying to build a human capital for your nation mm -hmm. and say, yeah, you know, for any kind of cost mm -hmm. for the favor of a girl, let's just uh, bring it down there. Mm? Yeah, but you see, sometimes we, we think that uh, when people do very well in academics, then they're very good. It's just, it's just about how can we get more females there? They're as good as any one of us. You mean they, they, they can't be supported to actually make sure that they perform quite cred uh, uh, strongly as the boys, as you're talking about? Because I think yeah. for me, that is what should be addressed. Mm -hmm. Give the proper capacity to just equitably to all of them. And they will perform because that has been proven to be done in private schools, in different areas, in other countries. Yeah. If you insist on in just doing some kind of uh, uh, sequestering mm -hmm. and giving exclusive attention to a girl, mm -hmm. It, it generates this actually apathy in a girl not to work as faster and as harder. So it forces the whole intention of that. But we're saying, it's not just, uh, think about it. We're saying we have only 20 girls at high school compared to 100 mm -hmm. boys. <coughs> so they, they can't even, they're just very few of them are going to come up there. I'm saying if you shift the buzz a little earlier, that helps. Mm -hmm. If there's anything you can do to get many of them doing certain things, that helps. Okay. That's all. all right. They're as good as any one of us, yeah. probably brighter than us, as yeah. you would know. But. Okay, just a pause on that. Let me go for a break. And then when we come back, uh, uh, Faith, we, we deal with why there's a persistence of the very conditions that we're talking about that are the impediments to girls' education. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Angela, we deal with, uh, uh, with the issue of culture and poverty. Thank you, our viewers, for keeping with us. And uh, let's go for a short break and come back and conclude this discussion. Thank you, our viewers. Uh, let's just get this video clip and see, see what Crane is doing to help uh, make a better life for the girl child. My name is Martha. I have had catch-up education in a creative learning center established by Viva and Crane in Uganda. Today, I'm training to be a teacher. And I want to help other girls in similar situations to mine. I dream of changing the future of many girls in my community and country. However, the demand is huge. More girls are needed to train as teachers so that together we can reach more girls. 
Martha is one of 30 young women who want to inspire the next generation. Can you help? It costs 200 pounds per month to support a trainee teacher over the next three years. Whether on your own, or with family, or friends, please give and help shape the futures of girls in Uganda. Viva and Crane, bring lasting change for marginalized girls. Thank you for keeping with us. This is NTV, uh, your number one station. I'm Karga Bodens from the Campus International Conference Center. So, um, <coughs> Faith, the, the Uganda National Strategy on Girls' Education cites four outstanding factors that are persistently disadvantaging girls' education, yeah, which we, to some extent we've talked about, and that is gender-based well, gender violence in form of rape, deferment, and sexual harassment, teenage pregnancy, family practices around gender division of labor, forced marriages, and uh, general value attached to girls' education, implying that there is some kind of economic connotation that if a girl gets uh, educated, mm -hmm. the, the, their bread price <laughs> will get there. Yeah, so the school infrastructure, which includes uh, physical facilities and the social environment. The, the, these are conditions that have been talked over and over. So in your own work, are there certain people or is there, are there people who are not playing their part? And what exactly do we need to do to curtail these, guys, these girls from being disadvantaged in the education system? Just a uh, short word. I in addition to what we've been okay. talking about. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's more a little <coughs> bit more complicated than just that because there are very many other factors that tend to make this a cycle that keep going mm -hmm. on. Um, on the gender-based gender violence, we are encouraging men and women, of course, not to have uh, corporal punishment or beat up each other in homes or even uh, abuse children so that they reduce the violence in, in homes, but also in school, the corporal punishment, there is already a law against corporal punishment, but teachers do not know how to discipline and manage children, so they tend to go back to the stick because that's how they grew up. So we need to have alternatives to all these, uh, uh, the, the problem of gender-based violence because it's about brought about by poverty, yes, but also by men going to drink and coming back home without any, any respect for the wife. So as children, they need to be brought up with respect for each other, mm -hmm. both male and female, that you just don't beat each other in order to, so, to, to solve a problem. You talk, you go to a table and dialogue and see where the solution is. Mm -hmm. For teenage <coughs> pregnancy, we want to continue working with Child uh, and Family Protection Unit, the police, to make sure that anybody who has abused children is uh, prosecuted. And there is an example for those people because there are very many young men and because of not having jobs, because we have a high rate of unemployment, they tend then to start casting their eyes on the social part of uh, pressing girls for sex. And therefore the girl says yes, because uh, somebody has, has said they love them and they have uh, a baby. But they don't follow up to look after that baby. They escape and go to another girl. So the, the, gu the guys, the boys, both men and boys, and boys need to be responsible. There's no, there's no way you can dodge and say, I just want to have free and fun sex without responsibility. Mm -hmm. There has to be responsibility that goes with it, and the man or boy has to make sure they are ready to face that. Mm -hmm. But also, there is a law on defilement. And so if these have been able to do that, then the government needs to strongly uh, make sure that they, the, the girls get justice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and men learn that they shouldn't play with girls in that way, they should respect them until after school. Family practices, of course, we have tried to bring in different laws to, de uh, to, to, to make sure that there is equity or in the way children do work at home, that the boy can go and fetch water as well as a girl. Um, the girl can also have time to have homework done instead of cooking for the boys. And so just that needs to be taught at home. So that is the parents' role mm -hmm. to make sure that they're teaching the girls and the boys that the work at home is not mainly just for the girls. Even boys need to do that because mm -hmm. they need it in their lives when they're single. Nobody's going to do it for them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so both laws, yes, both laws yeah. and b down from the ground, if we meet together and do our part mm -hmm. and implement what has been already written in the law by the government, Mm -hmm. and the parents can be able to follow that up, then the girl can have, find a safe space to say, yes, I'm now 
independent. I'm now able to do the things a boy can do. Mm. We're not looking for equality as such because we're not equal as individuals, but we're e looking for equity where we are given the same opportunities as boys are given, the same time, the same respect and confidence that we can do what the boys can do. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, Angela, that, that is literally, uh, in summation, two issues. Economics, which is the poverty, the prevalence of poverty, and cultural bent kind of uh, norms and practices. So how, because this seem actually to be the real nexus of the whole cycle and conundrum that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So how are they being dealt with? Just uh, in a short way, I have five minutes. And well, the Faith yeah. has already elaborated on certain aspects of our culture that are negative and of course at the end of the day standing mm -hmm. and delivery of edu education as a right. And as a sector, we are implementing the national strategy on elimination of violence against children in schools. And of course, that takes into account dealing with issues of uh, teenage pregnancy in schools. Mm -hmm. Well, that is coming out of the sexual violence, but also trying to engage the parents and communities in terms of eliminating child marriages, because that takes another big number of our girls. As a sector, we are also working closely with others in terms of uh, promoting sexuality education. Because uh, if girls can learn to say no and learn to really take on uh, sexuality, their sexuality as a very interesting component of their lives, then they'll be able to do away with cases of sexual abuse mm -hmm. and do away with cases of mm -hmm. teenage pregnancy. So sexuality education is also another important element mm -hmm. that will help, will help us reduce. Okay, That's thank you. Because of the thank you indeed. I, I, we can probe, but I think it's it's uh, promising. If you those are interventions. Now, Paul. Uh, lastly, uh, because of the constant in the half three minutes, mm -hmm. just uh, last words on uh, what Viva and uh, Crane. I think you'll be you'll be speaking on her behalf as yeah. you conclude. What are the future plans in your own regard? What do we need to focus on, and what are you people also focusing on? Um, Viva is focusing, <coughs> and, and Crane are focusing uh, a lot of. Uh, Issues to do with collective action. Mm -hmm. How can schools work with government, how work with the law mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, they create a safer environment for our children, whether it's girls or boys. To us, that's uh, one of those big issues that we want to make sure that uh, children learn in uh, a safe uh, environment. Mm -hmm. The things that I, need, I think are also important for us to focus on with the Ministry of Education, issues like how do we have a better, more exciting curriculum for our children, something that is more creative. How can we develop the psychosocial competences of our children? And I think for me that's very, very important in this uh, education system. That way we can provide better quality. Crane is working with teachers and training a lot of teachers on creative techniques of uh, delivering a subject. And hopefully we can get improved learning in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the classroom. We're looking to things like how do we improve attendance in class? Mm. For us those are, those are big issues. How do we govern schools better? That's uh, for us, that's prime. And how do we ensure that children are in a safe learning environment? Mm -hmm. If we can cater for those, we feel that uh, we will make significant progress. And of course, supporting the parents okay. to support the children. Thank you so much. And indeed, on that point, uh, we've, we've done a good lot of discussion. And I think it's qualitative, and I believe whoever is out there, mm -hmm. policy and general public, they, I think they're getting the case that we're making. The girl child needs to have a special focus, but of course, with the balance of ensuring that the boy is not left behind. And uh, on that note, um, Angela Nakafero, the Gender Specialist, Minister of Education, Gender Unit, Faith Kembabazi, uh, Crane Executive Director, and Paul Kabunga, Viva Africa Consultant. It's been great a great pleasure indeed having you on this discussion. Thank you. Hope Thank you very to much. see you soon. Thank you very Again. much. Thank, Thank you, our viewers. And indeed, thanks for keeping us as your number one station, NTV. And we keep on urging you, please, if you're out there as an NGO or a government ministry, an agency or department, and you want to have a structured discussion on a comprehensive matter of your own concern or the public concern, come, let's talk. Talk to our MD, that says team. Otherwise, here with my team, wish you a great afternoon and enjoy the rest of NTV Broadcasting.